Right, good morning everybody. Um, we're just waiting for, I think, the last few people who um, have refreshed the last minute just to, to sign in, um, but we, we'll make a start. Um, we've just got a bit of an intro, so as people are signing in, they won't miss too much in these first few minutes anyway. So um, welcome. Um, I hope everybody had a, a good um, bank holiday weekend and we are going to kick off this week with our next Microsoft Teams webinar, which is all around our favourite features. So if you've joined us for one of these events before, you'll know that we've covered some introduction to, to Microsoft Teams right at the beginning. And then we've gone into um, Microsoft Teams itself, so the Teams element of Teams. What we're going to do today is we're going to dot around a few bits of the software and use things that really we we really like and we think are really useful for everybody. So it's all about kind of getting the most out of Microsoft Teams today with some hints and tips, basically. So as you will, will know if you've been on one of these four, I'm joined by Tony and by Andy. So if we just make sure that everyone's sound is working, are you there, Tony? Yes, good morning, everybody. And Andy, are you there as well? Yeah, if you can hear me, good morning. Yeah, we can hear you both, no problem. So um, Tony is the Operations Director for, for HPP in Cameron, so um, he's going to be leading the session today. He's going to be driving effectively, and myself and Andy are going to kind of talk over our tips as we go. Um, Andy is um, our, leads the, the IT in, in, inside our group. So he's been instrumental in setting up Microsoft Teams the way that we use it. So hopefully for the three of us, you've got three different angles of, of coming at this and, and how we use it and what we do. Um, so just as people are joining, I'll stick my normal message up on screen. Obviously, if you can hear me, this is pretty irrelevant to you, but just a quick message up for anyone there that hasn't got sound and doesn't realise we've started. OK, so just to recap around Teams, um, we all started using this a however long ago this was now three weeks ago um, or so um, vastly more than we've ever used it before so even if you were using it chances are your usage has gone through the roof since home workings kicked in and chances are as well that you're fairly new to this software so this is where this webinar is aimed it's all about trying to teach you how to how to use it as well as possible get the most out of it individually and obviously get the most out of it for your organization as well so as always we we will be recording this session we'll be distributing it and you'll also have a chance to ask questions as you go along so you should have a q a button in kind of i think it's normally in the top right of the screen it's like a little um a speech bubble with a question mark in it feel free to fire through questions throughout the session no problem whatsoever um, Andy's going to keep a check on that and reply to anything he can as we go. We'll pick them all up at the end and we'll obviously verbally respond to everything so that everybody kind of gets the, the responses to the questions that are in there. Um, also, just a quick um, note, um, there's lots of resources we've put up. So we've been putting these up on our on our blog, so on hbpsystems.co.uk and cameron.co.uk. Quickest way is if you just scroll to the bottom of the home page, there's links to the blogs there, are our latest articles. Um, our previous recordings are all on our events section. Um, there's links to the free versions of Teams if you want to share that with other people that aren't using it so far. There's the quick start guide, which is the image that's there. There's a video on how to download the application for a mobile phone. And there's links to all the support guides as well to get more and more out of this. So loads of great stuff on the blog. We're sharing it all on social media as well. So if you're not following us on primarily LinkedIn and Twitter is where we're doing most of our communication at the moment. Um, you should be able to find us obviously if you just search for HPP systems or camera and computers. You'll find us on there. We're sharing this out on a regular basis as well as um, some more stuff which will hopefully be useful along the way as well. So moving on to today then so i'm going to start i'm going to do my top tips first and foremost then we'll move on to tony's um and then andy will wrap up with his ones before we go through and ask any questions so just to reiterate if you've got any questions as you go along um they don't necessarily have to be about what we're covering today if you've got other questions to do with teams if we can answer them we will answer them today if we can't we'll pick them up with you afterwards and we'll speak to you whether that's through ourselves or through the support team OK, so um, right, Tone, did you want to pick up on your screen and then we will uh, start with with my tips? Yeah, thanks, Phil. OK, so um, as usual, we'll just go and uh, share the screen. OK, hopefully everybody can see uh, my team screen at the moment. Um, so um, 
first tip we're going to hand over to Phil and I'm going to drive so over to you Phil. Okay so the first um, the first one I want to start with is something that I found really useful early on so this was while I was getting to grips with the system and I have to admit as, a, as I'm getting more used to teams I am using this a little bit a little bit less but it's really helpful straight away and it's the forward slash command so at the top of teams there as Tony's clicked in you've got a search bar basically now if you type a forward slash into that what you get back is a bunch of really kind of quick commands that you can use which as a newcomer to the software would probably be quite difficult to navigate around or find exactly what it is they can do so initially my first sort of usage with this was when i was being sent files in teams so i knew i was having conversations with was it with one person or was it in that group where was that file that someone sent me so if i literally just type in there forward slash and then files um, and then hit return that is then going to bring back all of the files that have been sent to me via Teams in a very quick and pretty much instant view. Not only that, it's going to tell me when they were sent to me on the right hand side with the date stamp as well. And I can even then it gives me a second search box as well. So if I know the name of one of those files, I can actually drill that down and, and search even further within that in that second search box. So when that gets populated more and more after a while of using it, I can then search even further to find that file. So a really quick and easy way of doing that and once i've finished there's a little cross on the right hand side and it will take me back to the beginning and if you just type that forward slash in for me again there tone just in the top what that also then comes across with is a load of different options there of things i can do with a really simple description on the right hand side of what they can do so um i think we're going to talk about mentions later on mentioning people so if i've been mentioned in various posts and i can't again remember where it is there's a forward slash mentions that I can then go and find all the places where someone's referred to me, probably asking me to do something or probably asking me to, to reply. But they're not all just searches. Some of them can put you on DND, for example. So if you're in the middle of doing something and you do that forward slash DND, it will whack you on that straight away and you don't have to go anywhere else in the system but use that forward slash. And the reason I really love that is it means I don't have to have some help sheet somewhere or anything else to remember what all these commands are they are all there with an explanation straight away so that's my first tip on the forward slash command to find some really quick functionality in teams um the second one i want to talk about is live events so what we're on today is a live event um, and for anyone that knows me i look after the sales and marketing um at hpp and cameron and my background is very much marketing and obviously everything that's gone on with covid19 has presented a very different challenge for businesses um, with regards to marketing and I genuinely believe the right approach is and has been so far at least to completely change your marketing and really to focus on an educational route certainly if you're a b2b business like like ourselves um, and spend your time sharing great content and, and trying to educate people on how to get the most out of what they've already got from you um, and this is always kind of part of our sales message but it really does kind of oh, overtake the sales message completely when we're in this situation whereas at the moment i'm sure that will change and everyone will eventually kind of revert back to their normal approaches with marketing but right now that's really important the challenge is not the expertise i'm sure you've got that i'm sure you're an expert in your field but actually your normal methods of doing that whether that's picking up the phone doing online marketing direct mail in the post and holding events have all kind of gone at the moment or certainly changed massively and are very very difficult but what you can do is run these sort of events for your customers live events or webinars as we we tend to call them and that's exactly like i say what we're using today so i just wanted to show you how quick and easy that was to do in teams this is functionality that you that you've no doubt got um so basically as Tony's already done, you go to the calendar in the top right, you've got new meeting. But if you do a little drop down on that, you have option at the bottom called live event. So if we click on that live event, that's going to bring us up a really easy screen to to create this. So we give it a title as Tony's done and then we can choose the date and we can put some text in. Now, this is just an internal bit of text that's going to go to us. So nobody else is going to see this bit of it. And then on the right hand side as well, once Tony set up that date, we can invite presenters. So we've mentioned a few times we're all obviously working remotely. So myself, Tony and Andy are all in very uh, are in different places at the moment. So I can invite these guys in to be presenters 
of my event and you've already seen Tony take over that event once we get up and running. Um, there's two differences there, a producer and a presenter. A producer has a few more rights on what they can do around editing. A presenter will be able to do everything from the actual event point of view. So once we set that up, we hit next. And we're presented with a few options. Now, I won't labour those firstly, they're fairly self-explanatory, but for what we're talking about today, we want this to be a public event because we're actually sharing this with our customers. So we don't want it to be limited to people within our organisation. We want to make that public so anyone can join. And then if we scroll down a little bit more, for some reason, this box is always unticked, but this is the Q&A, which we obviously encourage and ask people to use. I'd strongly recommend using it if you're going to do this. It's the primary method of communication you generally want to use when running a webinar so people can ask questions and, and you can fire back answers as, as you go. Basically, you can do that in the live event either privately if they ask you questions or you can publish their question and your answer so that everyone can see it. And then once we've done that, um, if we hit schedule. That's our event created. Um, and then at the top there, it prompts you straight away. We can get that attendee link. So the email that you generally receive from, which comes generally from me, um, from the HPP systems announcements address, or you might get it from my colleague, Tim Pritchard, who tends to just cover up the last minute um, registrations while I set up the webinar. That's what we're sending you. Basically, we're sending you that link and all you you know what happens then you click on it and you end up joining the meeting and off you go. Um, you can obviously edit that meeting there if you need to. Um, if you've made any mistakes or you want to add anyone else in and it's as simple as that. Um, what we're now going to just show you is just how it works from a from a producer and a pre presenter point of view once you set up that webinar. All very well setting up, so I think you're going to join there, Tone. So your first option is, is connecting to that. You can turn on your, your sound and your video like a normal meeting. Generally, you want to go into this quiet and with your video off just to make sure if it's working and you're presented with this screen so you basically have the screen on the left as you look at it is where you're going to add your content and then you can move that over to the right so that people can can see it so to do that we have the share bottom in the bottom right so we pick some content and then when we're ready we can hit that little send live button underneath and our viewers will start seeing that as they begin to join. Once that is line live, um, we can basically hit the start button at the bottom to, to get that up and running. So if you hit send live there, Tone, I think you have, yeah. So that will then move over to the right hand side, which is what your viewers can see. So the start button is going to do two things. It's going to open up your audio to all of your attendees and it's also going to start the recording as well. Once you've done, once you've hit that start, then that start button changes to end. And that's obviously when you end the meeting. If you're a presenter, you can leave the meeting without ending it, but you don't really want to hit that end meeting until obviously it's finished and done. Appreciate a lot of what we're going through today. There's a lot of information here. So there's again some really great help guides. We're going to share these afterwards. We're recording this event so you can come back and watch these steps and see it happen. But this is a really great way of keeping your marketing going and speaking to your customers on a regular basis. In terms of pr promoting these events in these tough times from a marketing point of view, the first session we did, which was the, the most open session for beginners, for kind of all users, um, we used email, which is working surprisingly well at these times. Um, social media and our email footers that we have on the bottom of, of all of our staff's emails um, and we had nearly 300 people sign up for that first webinar so it's and that's the most successful webinar we've ever run by a, by a long long way I think that's closely followed by everything around GDPR where we were tending to get around 50 or 60 to each webinar um, so yeah to have 300 sign up with relatively no marketing and obviously incredibly low cost marketing um, this is something you really should consider. OK, so that's kind of the, the, the first tip of, uh, or sorry, my second tip around setting them up. But it's also worth going on to my next tip, which is then the information you can get once you've run these events. So I think Tony's going to go to a past event now from last week. 
And if we go into that now, what we have, what we're provided with by Microsoft Teams through the live events is information about that event. So um, we have three, three resources, basically. The first one's a recording. So we can download that. We just hit the little download button next to it and it, it downloads. And that's, a, I think it's an MP4 file, um, which means that we can then upload that to YouTube. No problem. That'll work with pretty much any kind of video software out there that we need to do it. So we can publish it on our website or publish that on our YouTube channel so that people who have missed the session can watch it again, or we can keep using that in our marketing going forward. We also have the Q&A report. So any questions that come in, we can download them. That's great content then for your blog. So you can turn that into a little article about all the questions people have asked about your product or your service. And the final one is the engagement report, probably the least useful to be honest, but it tells you who signed on when, did people leave in it and what went on. So if you're doing them regularly, you can see if there's any points in your webinars where everyone drops off and, and disappears um, and doesn't stick around basically. So that's a a really useful bit of this is great running webinars, but being able to use the recording on top of these as well is fantastic. And, and as you saw, that's already turned on when you set up the webinar in the first place. So you don't have to do anything for that webinar, that recording, sorry, that will happen straight away. It normally takes, depends how long your meeting was, it normally takes about an hour for that recording to come through. But the Q&A report and the attendee um, engagement report are pretty instant. Um, so there you go. OK, right on to my um, my fourth tip. So if we can just go back into um, chat tone, I'm going to talk about notify, notify when available. So one of the things that Tony covered on our first session was about the little colored dots that sit next to people's faces on that, that chat screen there, um, which show you their status. So red generally meaning busy or in a call, um, orange meaning that they're away and green meaning that they're available. So what you'll find is that you, you'll try and get hold of someone, you'll either phone them or you'll send them a message and then they won't reply and then you'll send another one or you try and phone them again and they won't reply and you can't get hold of them. The old sort of um, uh, telephone, telephone tennis of going back and forth and missing each other. But these three little dots that are on the right hand side, there's a proper name for those three little dots, isn't it? I can never remember what they are. Um, but yeah, to click on those breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs. Is it? breadcrumbs, that's the one. Um, so if we click on those three little dots on any of these people, what we can do is we could notify when they're available. So what that's going to do if we stick that alert on is when that person becomes available again, so they're, they're out of their call or they're back at their desk or whatever it is, we're going to get a little notification to say in this case, Andy Bolton is, is available again. And that means I can jump back on and I can give him a call when I need to give him a call without kind of hounding him in the meantime. Now, it is important that that alert stays on. It's not a one time alert. So if you don't turn it off, it will constantly remind you when that person's back and forth online. So to turn it off, you do exactly the same. You click on the, uh, the breadcrumbs, the three little dots, and you turn off that notification on that person. But again, a really useful one for if you've got people that are away all the time and then you want to get hold of them or want to know where they are and all of that sort of things. Um, and then my final one is about editing files in Teams. And again, we did a little bit about on this on the first session, um, but I wanted just to show you how powerful it is. So have you, have you got one in there, Tone, that's maybe got a PowerPoint or something like that? Or There we go. So, as you'll know, with, with Office 365, you, you get your standard um, uh, functionality of being able to edit in browser with, with most plans. But within Teams, this actually allows us to edit it within Teams as well. So we don't even need to jump out at all. Um, you can make all the edits. So yeah, just feel free to edit this tone because uh, we can we can put it back, no problem. So we can we can type into it. We've got all of the functionality along, along that top ribbon as well. So we can import images, we can move images. We've got all the picture functionality to, to edit them, to change them um, and do everything you want. It's really feature rich. As you see, we add notes along, giving away all our scripts here as well, aren't we? So show how planned we are. But it, it is really feature rich. It works just like the full software and you never have to go out. So you can flick to chat, you can flick back again and you can keep working on this document really, really easily. If you prefer to, there's options to to chuck that out into the desktop app, for example, as well, which is um, on the top just below the main search bar. 
open in desktop app. That'll pop it out. If you make your changes in the desktop app as well, it will save back to your version in Teams, no problem whatsoever. But what we found is that for your normal changes, updating things, adding new slides, tweaking stuff between you, this works absolutely perfect. And just like we've mentioned before as well, anyone we've shared that file with can go in there and do that. So we can work collaborati collaboratively on this. We can make notes as we go along for what we've changed and what we've updated. Really, really easy and really, really good. And I'm showing you PowerPoint here, but this goes for, for obviously Word and Excel um, and any other Microsoft documents as well. And there you go, so that's my five. So just to recap, my, my five tips were the forward slash commands that allow you to get to areas quickly within the software, setting up live events, uh, reviewing those live events once you've run them, uh, notifying when people become available, and finally editing files within Teams. OK, so I'll hand over to Tony now, who's going to cover um, five tips from his side of things. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, great. OK, um, the first one um, we did mention last time, but I think it's 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 really important to do this is um, just to remember if you're having a conversation with anyone, whether it be in, in, in Teams uh, or, or actually in the chat, if you want to make sure they get um, get a notification and make sure they do see this because they might have their notifications changed differently um, uh, to, to the standard. Always remember to at someone. So if I do at in this group here in this team, it's going to suggest um, people to at, but I can simply, oops, if I could type today, I could type Phil um, if he was in this group, sorry. If I type Andy who is in this group, it will at him and anything I type after this, um, it will then notify him. Um, and as you may have the saw, because Andy was a bit premature, Andy, if you could do it again, it will pop up a little purple, purple notification here. Um, Andy's done the same to me, me in reverse, and it pops up and just tells you that Andy's mentioned me in that. It's really useful. Um, everybody's using Teams in different ways, and it's really useful just to make sure you're not missing anything and uh, not losing out on uh, any of that information that's been shared. So that's a real simple one, um, but I think it's a real good tip to remember uh, when using Teams. The other one is, as Phil mentioned, we, we've we've uh, seen a, a big uptake uh, even in within the business with, with using Teams recently. Um, and one thing people struggle to struggle to do, and what we're seeing a lot of, is is replying to a thread. So if I've started a thread, um, hi Andy, um, what? What are your thoughts? Um, what um, on this? And we put that in there. What we're actually seeing is people trying to use this um, in a chat environment, and that looks great. Um, and replying here rather than replying to the thread, and all you end up with is just conversation after conversation but there's no flow with that there's no continuity so just to remember to reply to the question in in the um, in, in the actual post there rather than just replying in the in the chat because otherwise you're just going to end up with tons and tons of chat spread all over the place and nobody's going to know where anything is and there you go as you can see Andy has replied to that he's pressed a simple reply button on this thread and replied in that and then obviously everybody can reply to that anything relevant to this post or this thread um, it is in there in a collaboration point of view, but what we're seeing and even in our organisation is people just starting a new conversation at the bottom rather than replying and it can get a bit messy um, to try and find things and, and, uh, and work from there. So it's a, it's a good tip to remember. Next tip is uh, about recording. So if I'm in a chat for argument's sake, so I'm going to start a new chat here. Um, and this is useful um, in the respect of, so I'm going to start a new chat. Um, I'm going to voice call Rachel here. Um, and hopefully she'll answer. Great. OK, um, Rachel has answered. Um, so what it enables me to do in here is to do a few things um, that I think are very useful. So initially um, we can add in Oh no, we can't add in. We should be able to add in the whiteboard functionality, but what we're noticing recently with, with Microsoft is they're actually pulling some of these functionalities out currently um, to do with load, and we seem to have lost that. So I'm just going to hang that up. 
um, and I'll see if we can add it in a slightly different way. So if I just do a meet now, which is the same principle as what we was just going to show you. Um, but I will connect to a meeting here. I'll just give that. And we have the whiteboard functionality. So um, back back here then. So um, what it allows me to do is share a whiteboard, uh, which I think is really, really useful. We're all in disparate locations nowadays. Um, and what it allows us to do is allows us to collaborate as if we're in a meeting room um, up on the screen, which we have found massively useful. Um, so we were doing some um, specifications for a customer the other day and we were, we were trying to um, draw out a network diagram. So what it allows us to do real time live is to collaborate with anybody that's in this call um, and draw out a very, very simple network. We can also drop in here images if we want to and overlay images, um, but it allows us all to collaborate and work together um, on a, in a visual format rather than just an audio format from there. And we can simply pop out of that and stop presenting that screen and just go back to the normal screen from there. Um, the other thing that's commonly uh, asked is, well, I've got a meeting up and running um, or I've got a chat up and running um, and I want to now add somebody else into that chat. So it might be a couple of us having that conversation. We said, oh, actually, we need to bring Phil into that chat. All we simply need to do is press the show participants option here and I can simply type up here and add them in. That is now going to call Rachel into this chat. She will join it, whether it be video, uh, voice chat, could it be the whiteboard that we were showing you earlier, and it will add her in and she will answer from there. So as you can see, it's added Rachel in, as we can see at the moment, and now we're in a chat and we can simply add as many people in here as we want to. So we could add Andy in. If it hadn't called, it would tell us here. If he didn't answer, it would say no answer. It gives us a little refresh button from there so we can do uh, so we can refresh him and try and add him in. As you can see, it's calling him down the bottom and he's answered from there. So it's really useful for bringing people in, whether that be just a chat. So we could simply have the, the chat window open here um, and be talking via chat. This could be video. Um, it could be voice. It could be pretty much anything from there. So it's really useful. The final thing um, which uh, we again used the other day um, in conjunction with the whiteboard, so we, we, we wireframed everything out on the whiteboard um, and what we wanted to do is uh, to, rather than taking meeting notes from the meeting, um, we actually recorded that meeting and it's as simple as start recording. What it will do, it will record it, it will notify everyone we're recording, it says at the top here you're now live and we are recording. Um, so everybody gets to see that and we recorded the whole meeting. So that was the chat conversation or the voice conversation um, and the whiteboard side of things as well, which means when we would finished it, we've got that as a form of meeting notes to go back on and distribute that to everybody within the team, which was really useful. It got away from the traditional method of taking notes down and distributing to everybody. Anybody in that chat, if I hang this up, um, the recording has started. It will drop when available, like Phil says. It doesn't come through straight away, um, but it will drop that recording into there um, and allow anybody in that chat to be able to go back, look at that recording and, um, and find anything that they wanted to find from there. Um, as you can see, it's saving now. It will drop in there and um, go from there. So that's it from me. That's my uh, five tips for today. I will now hand over to uh, Andy Bolton. Hello. Uh, so my my uh, couple of tips are around mainly around these uh, chat area um, of Teams. So the the first one is if you just want to go in and try and make a new chat with someone, um, and click the little arrow on the right hand side there. So what this allows us to do is uh, we can actually name chats. So this is really, really useful if you want to keep a chat available so for searching or if, you, if you're actually discussing a certain project or topic, you can actually name it at the at the top there. And if you just go and just send a quick message to uh, the user. Um, as you can see there on the left hand side, it's actually kept that name. Um, you can then pin the chat and keep it available for you. Um, it's just really, really useful to have that information so you, you can go back, you can see what you're actually talking about um, and it's got the relevant information there um, just on the name. Uh, it's really, really useful. Um, the next uh, tip I've got is about the favourites and contacts. So you can uh, favourite and 
favorite a person to keep them available for you and you can also um, add them into your contact section. So if you just want to skip over to the contacts. So as you see in here, there's a uh, uh, there's not many uh, contacts actually listed on on here. There's normally a big list on, on the, at the bottom there. And um, so if you want to just add a add a person. Yeah, I think it's a that's a contact group that we're adding there, but that's that's fine. So we can actually add um, groups of contacts there, but you can you see you can actually add contacts to the to the group. You can just search your entire organization for them. Uh, as as Tony's just displayed there. Now what we can do as well, as you can see, they're actually showing up as favorites in there because that's the actual favorites group. So if um, in that uh, group at the bottom where it says Andy Bolton, if you just want to click the uh, the little ellipses at the bottom there, yeah, and just add a contact. Um, if you want to try and add Phil in there. Perfect. So you see, he's actually not showing up in the it was showing up in the favorites pick. Is it is in is one of the favorites? But you can actually um, click the oh, that right. Uh, you can click three little dots uh, on the actual person. You see, you can remove them from the group. You can also favorite them in there as well. And so what that does, it keeps the people right at the very, very top in the top group called favorites. Uh, which makes it a lot easier to contact the people if you have them uh, that you actually communicate with them quite often and um, you can just click your contacts and they're available there and um, they're also um, in the recent tab if you just go into there and um, we've uh, we'll go into the next section which is about saving and pinning uh, pinning chats so you see that at the top there there's uh, three chats that have actually been pinned so it's uh, very similar as the adding contacts as favorites it will keep the chat right at the very, very top so it's really easy to get to um, and it's available for you so to do that you just as uh, Tony just shown there you just click the eclipse and um, ellipses um, and click pin and that will add them into the top section there now you can unpin this just uh, click in the three little dots again you can show on there uh, you just unpin and it removes that chat from there and um, so it's a really good way of just keeping information relevant and available for you really, really quickly. Uh, you don't have to scroll down searching through, especially if you've got um, a very busy uh, chat section where you're just scrolling down because you've got a lot of people in your organization. If you pin three or four um, main contacts that you're discussing with quite often and you're always chatting with, they're always available at the top of your screen. Um, now the next bit is about saving posts. So as you're actually chatting with people, um, they may bring up some relevant information that you're thinking, oh, I, I probably need to keep that because um, it's quite uh, interesting information. Um, you can find the actual the relevant post and then click the ellipses and you can see this should be, I think it's in here, save this message at the top there. Um, and what this does actually just tags the message so it's um, it's saved and available for you. So to get to that, if you just click the name at the top right there and you've got a little saved section. Um, and that'll list basically all these saved chats you've got, you've well, saved posts um, that you've got available and they can unsave these at uh, any point as well just by clicking that little button that says unsave. Um, it's again, it's just a really quick way of saving relevant information um, and exactly the same aspect of pinning a full uh, chat is you can uh, save specific points within a chat so you, you can get to that information really quickly. Um, and the next bit is about marking posts as unread. So when you actually uh, chats as unread, so obviously sometimes you'll you'll jump into a chat and you'll see someone's left you a message. And you're like, ah, actually, I'll I'll come back to that a bit later. So the easiest way to do that, just to obviously keep it bold, is click in the ellipses um, on the um, click at markers on red. And as you see, it's actually marked. It's gone into bold again. So you you know you need to look at that chat. Um, and then the last one is about screen sharing, which I think Tony's pretty much shown earlier, but we'll just go into a quick chat if we can, if you go to meet now. Uh, 
And if you just want to yeah, click share in there. So you can do this with anyone. Um, you can obviously do it on your own or in groups of up to around 200 people. I think you can actually share your screen. So you can select one. If you've got multiple screens, you can you see on the on the uh, demo there that you can actually save a uh, screen one. Uh, there'll be screen two, three, depending on how many screens you've got. You can also share individual windows, uh, which is pretty much what we tend to do when you're doing PowerPoint presentations and such. So you can just show them the PowerPoint or the Excel window. Um, this this works um, from a, a very good point on if you want to collaborate on something that you've got open on your machine to say like a web page. Um, if you just uh, click share screen, um, you can actually get an option there as well to give control to other people. So if you may struggle here because uh, we're, we're demoing yeah. and uh, I got it then. So um, what you can do, you can actually give other people permissions to control your screen. So it's really good if you want to say, oh, just um, just have a quick look at this Excel spreadsheet. I'm having a bit of a problem with it. Uh, you share that out and they give them control so they can actually click in and fix that problem for you um, if it's on your local machine and not shared in teams so say you've got something in your OneDrive and you think oh just can you just have a quick look at this now while we're while we're on, on a team meeting um, and that's my points that I wanted to go through um, I'll hand you back over to Tony Thanks very much, Andy. Um, so hopefully you've found that useful today. What we wanted to cover off is sort of five each of our top tips to try and help you uh, use Teams better. Phil, I don't know if you've got anything to add. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. No, I think we've got we've got a few few Q and A's in as well, which are kind of probably the the next step of, of building on some of them as well. Um, I think if I pick the first one up, um, which was yeah, just read the question so I can actually get it right. Um, why did we choose Eventbrite for the event? Um, and can you say how you do it? Um, yes, I tell you what, let me share my screen and I'll show you. Phil, can I just do the next one while I've got my screen shared and then we well, can pop back to there? So yeah. the, the next question, sorry, was uh, can I delete a chat? Um, and yes, you can. Um, as you noticed here, I deleted one with Phil earlier. Um, but if I go in here, um, I can click the breadcrumb, um, go into there and click delete. That will delete that element of the conversation that we've had um, from there. And if uh, I wanted to then remove the chat, I could hide it from here. So I can use that to delete any post within the chat. And then if I press hide, that's going to disappear from the conversation. So hopefully that answers that question for you from there. Um, and there is a follow up question to that, which is what happens if you do delete it? Is it for everyone or only for themselves? Um, uh, Andy might be able to collaborate on that to uh, concur, but I'm sure once it's deleted, it's deleted for everybody. Um, it will show like it did on that one that there was a message deleted, very much like uh, WhatsApp. Um, so it shows that the message was there, but it will delete it for anybody that's in that team or chat. Am I correct on that, Andy? Yeah, it does um, delete. It depends on the policies that you've set on the organisation. So you can actually set it so people can't delete their own messages that they've sent. Um, you can also set it so they can only delete delete messages for themselves so that it, the other person will still be able to actually see that message. Um, and one of the good things about Teams is obviously everything is logged and tracked. So even if you do delete the message, it's still going to be in the tracking so you can um, go back and see those messages even if you've deleted it out of the chat. Yeah, as an admin, but by default, everybody can delete their own chats. It's that's a, a more an advanced setting that we can do in the background. So. Thanks, Andy. I'll just hand over to Phil and I'll just stop sharing. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just share quickly and then we'll uh, let me just get that right. You should have Eventbrite up on the screen. Is that showing? Yes, it is, Phil. Yeah. Yes, it's on cool. the screen. So the question was about Eventbrite. So you'll all know that when we're running these events, we're using Eventbrite as kind of a middleman for managing um, our registrations. So um, the question was kind of why do we use that and and how do you do it? So the first question, the first question uh, of why do we use it? One, we've used it for ages, so we continue to because we get on with it. It's really good. It's completely free, which is probably um, a good point in that. So the only way that Eventbrite make their money um, through events is when you start charging for events. So if you run free events like this, there's no cost, there's no subscription, there's no charge per sign up or anything like that it's literally just a free service in that respect if you start charging for them they take 
a percentage of the, the ticket, basically. So that's how they make their money. So just to show you how easy this is, you obviously have to sign up for an account. But once you've got that, we can manage our events. Um, and you will see today's event um, and the one that we're going to talk about in a bit, which is what we're doing next week, which is all set up. But if I want to create an event, I literally hit create event and it's steps me through it one by one so i give it a title i pick a type of event category all of that and then and the dates and then the final thing is just setting up the tickets which is basically you set up a free ticket you decide if there's a limit on it i mean we normally put a big limit on it i think um is it ten thousand? i think that that you can have on on live events so you well if you can get near that brilliant but you're unlikely to get ten thousand people i would imagine on your live event um, and all that's doing really is that's giving you then a way to manage your signups and things like this. Now, I can't obviously go into that bit of it because you'd see all the data, which we, we can't do. But there's an area to manage your attendees where you can go in, you can export the lists of the people that are signed up. So you can then send out connection details. You can, we don't like doing it, but you can get Eventbrite to send those confirmations as well. The only reason we don't like doing it is they, they do often get stuck in spam, whereas if we send the email ourselves, then it kind of works a treat. So it's really replacing kind of a big spreadsheet and managing emails coming back and forth in that we see when people are registered and when we're at the point where we need to start sending out emails, we can drop into Eventbrite. We can pull out the details of who's registered and we can send out the connection details that I'm sure there are other systems out there, um, but we've been using this for a while now. It's always been really good. Um, it's always worked really well for us. And like I say, it's free when you're doing free events. So, so simple as that, really. OK, did you want to take back over to I think there's a couple of others. Yeah, there, team. thanks very much, Phil. Um, Andy, then. Um, so, Andy, if you could share your screen, um, screen sharing, um, giving other people control of your screen. Could you elaborate a little more? Would you just be able to show that a bit more in depth, please? Put Andy on the spot now. Two seconds. Let me just uh, get something loaded up to you real quick. OK, well, while Andy's doing that, I'll just answer another question then. So chat groups versus teams, what's the advantage, disadvantage over each other? Um, we did we did cover a bit of this uh, last week, um, really. Uh, and again, Andy and, and Phil can interject on this. That the idea of teams is to bring a, a static number of people together or a, a group of people together that you can control and have governance over. When you start um, putting people together in chat, you've got pretty much no governance over that, no control over that. Um, and it can get a bit out of control. The idea really of the sort of the chat is for kind of instant, quick, um, quick conversations. Whereas the team, you can have control over it. It's more in a structured manner. Um, that would be kind of my, my interpretation of it. Phil or Andy, have you got anything else to add? Yeah, that's exactly how I'd describe it. I, I kind of see teams as being a bit more permanent. So I think of them like departments almost where, where they're, they're always going to exist. Um, your, your group chats are a bit more off the cuff. Um, so we do have sort of like groups of people that I talk to regularly, but the, the content isn't necessarily around a theme. Whereas if we were going to have a project or a department or a, a, a a marketing campaign or something like that that's going to involve a lot more files a lot more structure and I, I want to be able to keep keep going back to that and referring to that same subject that's when I would tend to use a team there whereas a group chat would be a lot more kind of fluid within its content I wouldn't necessarily be sticking files in there because they would become irrelevant fairly quickly and then people would forget where they were cool okay uh, Andy then so screen sharing yeah, I hope you can, um, you can see my screen on here. Yeah. Um, so one of the good things about the screen sharing and obviously giving people access, if I if I go down here, we should be able to share my screen up here. So you see I've got uh, share screen one, uh, which is currently what I'm doing at the moment. So if I try and click that, let's see if it's going to live invent. Yeah, it's going to actually kick me out. Yeah, we're probably going to struggle trying to display this on my my screen because I'm actually in the live event. OK, um, no, so no we'll worries. Probably have to do it's it it's fairly self-explanatory on the screen, isn't it? Once you hit that share button and you, you share that screen that Andy got to, 
the the next step really is the other person sees that screen and there's an option on 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 both ends actually you can request control at the other end so if you're looking at someone's screen you can do that or you can give control if you've shared your screen um it seems to work really well i mean i've done it with a few of the guys just around um using like our crm system and stuff where someone's got stuck and normally they pop into my office and say how do i do this They've come online going, how do I do this? And I've tried to talk them through it. Oh, just give me control. And they've given me control and I've jumped in, press that, press that, press that, and you're sorted basically. So it's quite intuitive once you get onto that screen, although we can't demo it. I think it's even a big red button at the bottom actually that says give control or um, or ask for control, request control. So once you do that, you, you're kind of in a position where you can do one-to-one -one support or collaboration um, live with with the screen at either end of those two two people. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, we could probably see if um, Tony, if you want to do it on your uh, your a person demo account, if you just want to just uh, share your screen on there um, to this actual Teams testing chat, we'll see if it actually shows up. Okay, can. Can everybody see, yeah, you can see my screen. Um, so this team's testing chat here, Andy, yeah? Yeah, so as you can see down here, we've got a request control. I'm hoping you can still see the screen I've got got open here. No, sorry, Andy. No, the, no. Is it keep me the, out? The, it? No, the request control doesn't actually show on this. It's probably part of the, the yeah. way that we're doing the live event. Um, but it would yeah. normally be there for the, for the end user, yeah. OK. What we'll do is we can do some screen grabs of that and we can share that with everyone at the end if that's OK. Um, there was a, another question came in. Um, how can we add an external person to a chat? Um, very straightforward. Um, if I wanted to do a new chat with, say, Andy Bolton, um, so I'll pick Andy and then I wanted to have had an external person. Um, so I've got Rob Partridge, who's um, one of our um, uh, suppliers. I can simply add him in there and now I've got a chat um, that could be a video call. It could be a share of a screen um, any sort of conversation with those two people, both internal and external of the organisation. Just one thing to bear in mind on that. Obviously, it's all, it is all based on permissions that set up on your tenancy. So I had a few questions last week about why people couldn't add those in. And obviously they do need to be um, enabled on your tenant. And obviously for me to be able to chat with that person, they do need to have a uh, Teams account as well. Yeah, there's two, I think there's two options on the admin section for that. One is effectively allowing you to um, invite anyone external, kind of opening it right up. The other one is that you can kind of whitelist domains so if there's certain customers that you, you want to bring in, then you can just whitelist certain domains. So if the person that's asked that question isn't able to do what Tony's just shown, it's almost certainly down to the fact that it's locked down to just your organisation or a specific set of organisations. So if you're trying to invite someone else from that, it's just not going to allow you to do it because it's locked out at an admin level. But if your organisation is happy to do that, I think it's just a it's a checkbox in the admin section um, that goes through that. I think that's it for questions. Okay. Um, um, I think yeah, no more questions it. at the moment. Doesn't look like. Just, uh... OK, so um, unless we have any more fire through, I'll just finish off with um, Q and a. Just a quick note on, on next week. Obviously, you saw on our Eventbrite, we've set up a um, uh, a, an event already for next Monday. Um, so we'll obviously share around the details of this. You may have been in, alerted by it through Eventbuy already if you get the emails from them. Um, we, we're going to cover something that we've had a few questions on in the first few weeks of this, um, which is Microsoft 365 Business Voice. So this is um, a product from Microsoft that sits within Teams. It's basically a full phone system. So as the image suggests, this can work with handsets. So Yaling handsets, um, I can never remember the name of the headsets. Is it Jabra? Jabra, Jabra, Jabra yeah. yeah. Yeah, Jabra headsets. Um, but also, it, as the screen shows, it can be paired with a mobile phone. It can be worked within Teams for calls. So this can actually be used to replace a phone system. Um, you can port numbers over to it. It can be your primary phone system for your business. Um, there are obviously some some costs per user based on this. There are um, call in plans associated with it and things like that. But if it's something that's of interest to you now or potentially in the future, 
then we will um, we'll be covering that next week and we're going to try and do our best to do a bit of a demo of it as well live. Obviously, we can't really demo the handsets and the headsets, but we're going to show you some of that functionality um, within the software, how that can work. Bit of food for thought, really, it's something that's coming onto a lot of people's minds now. Everyone's having to work from home using Teams already. This is a real option for combining those two things and sorting it out. Um, just had one extra question come through there as well about where previous files are shared for our live events. So the quickest and easiest answer to that is if you go to um, either one of our websites, so hppsystems.co.uk forward slash events or cameron.co.uk forward slash events. Um, if you just scroll down past the, the first event, you get into all of the recorded sessions that we've done in the past. That's all of our Microsoft Teams events, but also everything we've ever done in the past around um, our accounting software and that. If you click on one of those past events, there was a video embedded on there straight away. You can also find them on our YouTube channels, but I will share those links as well on the emails that I send around after this, just so that everybody's got them if they want to refer back to the previous recordings as well. Um, that webinar as well, just that's going to take place on Monday at 11 a.m. next week. We will obviously record it and, and do what we normally do from that perspective as well. Um, the attached files, I'm not entirely sure. Does anyone know what that question refers to that's just come in attached files? I don't know. I'll uh, I'll just reply and I'll ask for some further information on it. So. Yeah, OK, we'll pick that one up. If, if not afterwards, Alison, I'm not, not entirely sure which files uh, you're referring to there, but we can whatever whatever it is you're looking for, we can share that with you. No problem whatsoever. Um, again, we're putting all of this stuff on our blog and on our social media as, as quickly as we possibly can. So they, this should all be with you by the, this afternoon. Be well. Cool. Well, I think I think that's probably the last of our questions. So hopefully that was useful. Um, are the, the ones we sorry, it's come through the ones we shared last week. Yeah, I'll reshare them. No problem. Again, if you want to find them, they are on our blog. We have posted quite a lot recently, so you might have to just look down to last week. I think it's called useful resources, something like that on our blog, but all of those are on there. Um, so have a quick look and you should be able to find them, but I'll send the links around as well. No problem. So hopefully you found that useful. Like I say, those are some some tips to kind of get the most out of it. I'm sure you will will you find your own favorites as well as you go along and start using this software more. Um, I think next week, like I say, we're going to do the voice. We are still planning on doing an admin section as well because a lot of the questions that come up are are can I turn this on? Can I turn this off? Why is that not working? If you've got questions like that in the meantime, feel free to fire through to us or speak to our support team. Obviously, if you're one of our customers, if we look after your Office 365, then we can just jump in and we can turn things on and off um, as long as you've obviously got the authorization to tell us to do that. Um, and we can we can help out however we can, basically. So unless Tony or Andy have got anything to add at the end, I think um, I think that's about it. No, that's all good from me. Uh, thank you everyone for attending um, and uh, we'll see you next week, I hope. Lovely. Right, thank you very much everyone. Um, have a good week.